I need some traction. Hey, Traction fam, super excited for today's guest, Devo Harris, Grammy-winning producer behind Kanye West and John Legend. He's also an accomplished Black artist whose move into tech has caught the attention of major brands like Adidas, Nike, Lexus, H&M, Paramount, NASCAR, and more. And Devo transitioned from rap and R&B legend to impressive tech exec. exec. His company, Adventure, leverages AI and patent audio technology to give viewers a choose-your-own adventure-style interaction with commercials, movies, and games. So super excited to get right into it. I think you're a Wharton grad as well, right? Before you went into music and before you became an entrepreneur. I guess you're always an entrepreneur. So let's dive into your story from like childhood to Wharton to music to then becoming an entrepreneur. What was that journey like? Uh, it's long and arduous and fun. Where did you grow up, by the way? I'm an army brat, so I grew up everywhere. Uh, so um, both my, my mother and father were in the army. And so I, I grew up throughout the South and the, and the Midwest of America. But I actually, a lot of my growing up was in Germany. Oh, wow. Uh, so I spent probably like six years like, in elementary school really in, in Germany. I used to speak German and all, all that. It's a great skill to learn multiple languages. I was born in Kuwait. I was a refugee of the Gulf War in the 90s. You probably remember that time. And uh, we made our way to Canada and then after engineering, moved to the U.S. So familiar, not familiar with the lives you live, but I've seen the army <laughs> very closely as they came to rescue us through the camps. So what led you to then eventually Wharton and how did the whole Kanye West, John Legend thing happen? Sure, I, I'll, I'll try to condense this. But uh, um, as a child, I always saw myself as a as a businessman. Uh, I don't even know what what that meant at the time. I just saw myself in a suit and with a briefcase, and 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 I wanted to work in a way so that my intelligence and that my ability to measure risk would be I, I'd be directly compensated based on my intelligence intelligence and risk tolerance whatever that means. And so as I grew up, that, that, that felt like business in, in, the, in the widest sense. And so I, I looked into what's the best business school in the world, found Wharton, uh, which is in Philadelphia. And I have a bunch of family in Philadelphia. So I said, that's where, where I'll, I'll go. I lived in Kansas City at that time. I applied to Wharton, got in. That's the only school I, I applied to. And so went there. And had a great time and learned a lot about building businesses and building relationships and and um, it's just a, there's just a big big change for me moving to the East Coast and being around like a lot of smart people and motivated people. So did that. I met life lifelong friends and um, you know when I was in when I was younger I I used to sing and I played sports. And then when I went to college, I hadn't sang for a couple of years, but I tried out for this acapella group at, uh, in college. Didn't make the uh, group, but all the, the friends that I was starting to hang out with, they all were typically involved in some sort of music. They were rappers or singers or guitarists or something. And so I still wanted to be in music. So I said, well, no one in the crew is a DJ. So I started to, to DJ. Uh, became a DJ at Penn, graduated. And um, my, whenever I graduated high school, my grandmother had came to Kansas City and said, hey, let's go meet your cousin. He's graduating in a couple of days. Never met my cousin before, but my mom convinced me to go meet this, this cousin in Chicago. And so traveled up after my graduation, met my cousin, went to his graduation. His name was Kanye West. And so from there, we had a great time, hung out for a few days. I went off to Penn, didn't talk to him for four years. And then uh, after I graduated, and I moved to New York with, with my college friends. And after a while, one of my aunts had contacted me and said, oh, remember that cousin that you met a few years ago when you graduated? He just moved to New Jersey. You should connect with him. And I enjoyed whenever we had hung out years ago. So I hit him up and I was like, 
hey, you know, it's your cousin. And, um, um, you know, if you're going to be in New York, come by my apartment. He came by that day. And he was telling me how he's working with uh, Jay-Z and just all these crazy things that were, to me, it was like, wow, this is just some whole bizarro world that you're talking about. But I thought he was super talented and, and he was really working hard. And um, that's how I started working with with uh, with Kanye. What year was this? Man, this was a while ago. This was probably 2001, I want to say. Well, that's a long time ago. So you know, my wife grew up in New Jersey and then did her residency at Drexel in Philly. And, yeah. uh, at, uh, and, and so I was running sales and marketing for Ticket Leap, which is a startup that came out of Wharton there. And John Legend was an advisor. So maybe there's some common connection. Yes, yes. I, 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 I remember that company. I remember John being involved with it. And, um, you know, in this early 2000s, I just graduated from Wharton. I had all my fancy friends, like working at McKinsey and Goldman Sachs. John worked at BCG, the Boston Consulting Group. And the internet bubble burst, and there's a recession. September 11th happened. It was like all these things back to back, just like crushing the economy. So a lot of my friends were um, losing their their jobs, getting laid off. I got laid off. I was working at a, a consulting firm, and and I was laid off. So everyone was like really feeling it. And these are people who we went through the right steps. We went to Ivy League schools, et cetera. At the same time, my cousin, Kanye, he dropped out of college. Um, he was doing all the risky things that you're not supposed to, to do. He's being an artist. He's not in school anymore. Um, he got evicted from his home. But at that time, he was the only person I knew whose career was skyrocketing. So I was just like, why are me and my friends who did what you're supposed to do, we're all in debt. And we are trying to figure out how to make a move and struggling. And my cousin, who did what you're quote unquote not supposed to do, his life is, his dreams are coming true. Maybe there's something in the matrix that what they're telling you to do isn't necessarily the right path for everyone. It's not as clean and safe as you might think. So that really changed a lot of how, how I, I operate, sort of seeing him in action. So then you moved on and started adventure what led you to that so or is it adventure adventure just like the regular word okay um, okay and um yeah i i was working with kanye and john and, and lots of artists for years and eventually wanted to change my career while i was still young enough to to, to do that so I went to business school at Columbia, but I was still, um, I, I still had a foot into the, the music world. And so I made a music video um, that was interactive, sort of choose your own adventure music video. And what was interesting uh, was that we put out a regular music video for this song, Attack of the Five Foot Hipster. It's still on YouTube. And we put out this video and then you see the comments saying, this song sucks, basically. And um, it, was, it was like rock rap combination. And the next week we put out the exact same video, but this one was interactive. So the, the first version we put out was just regular traditional video. The second one was the exact same visual content, exact same music, except there was a, a few points where you could choose which scene you would see next. That version, you see the comments saying, oh man, this song is awesome. This is going to be a hit. I love this song. It's the exact same song that people said sucked the previous week. And they were going to our website and buying the, the music that second week. They weren't the previous week. So it was like night and day how that same song was received and how it sold based on how it was delivered. Um, I thought it was just really fascinating. The next thing you know, all these big companies are coming to me saying, how do we make our content like that? And so this was a good 11 years ago or so. And so, yeah, I, I realized I had a big fascination with media from even working with Kanye. And I realized, oh, in the future, our media will be more dynamic and will be more interactive and more web native. 
And so, um, so I start getting into technology, building tools, and Adventure was born out of that. Fantastic. What a story. And then you mentioned before in prior interviews that it took leaving the music industry to gain credibility as an entrepreneur, but you were producing for Kanye and John Legend. I mean, uh, you must have had massive clout. Why did it take leaving the music industry to gain credibility as an entrepreneur? Well, I think it's a few things, and this is an interesting question. Um, I think one thing, even when I went to business school, I felt that people were saying, were basically feeling like, oh, you're in the music business? That's not like real business. Uh, <laughs> that's like a... It's creative. You guys are having fun, but it's not like real business. And I'm like, this is, this is real business. This is, this is, this space is where, um, technology disrupts first. Um, and if you remember LimeWire and Napster and everyone being like, Oh, what do you learn from the music business about technology disruption? And how do you deal with these new business models? Yes. Music is creating culture, creating trends. So from a marketing perspective, um, what does that look like? Like, you know, I'm in, I'm in my business school classes taking a marketing course and there's like a 70 year old professor telling me about marketing. And then I leave there to go meet with Kanye and then plan how we're putting out a global takeover album. They're very different strategies. I would argue that the Kanye conversation is a lot more relevant to today's marketing. So, um, so that, that's one thing, but I also think that the, the bigger thing is black music. So if you like had a, I remember there was a, another, there's a company that competed with, uh, with us early on and they were from Israel and the leader of that company uh, was a musician in Israel. And there was some like, I, I'd go to investor meetings or, and whatnot. People would be like, oh, this guy, he's a rock star in Israel. Oh my God, that's so great. That's one thing the 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 founder of patreon is a is a musician, but they're not black music people and the the lens through which oh rap and hip hop is is viewed is a little it's it's not it's not the same credibility as uh other artistic formats so when I go to meet my uh, my lawyer top tech lawyer in New York many years ago and I'm like. I want to do this, this. And he's like, look, no one's going to invest in you. Um, they're going to want to get a beer with you and, and hear your cool stories. No one's going to give a dollar to you. You're too different. Your story's too different. You look too different. It doesn't matter. It doesn't match any of the, the patterns that people see on the capital side. So I had to literally like disassociate from music over years and become a technology person as opposed to a quote unquote music person. I'm just a, a, a growth and, and builder. I don't care if it's music or furniture or, or technology, but a lot of my counterparts who did not look like me, who did not have the level of success of me, who had never built anything, they were able to receive um, backing a lot easier. Um, so you had, you had to shed sort of the the baggage that comes with being a music exec, but nonetheless, being a producer in that industry probably taught you a few lessons that helped you big time as an entrepreneur, right? What were the top things you learned as an entrepreneur that helped you in your journey to adventure? Yeah. I, I didn't know it was called entrepreneurship when, when we started, but you know, when, when I started working with Kanye, he didn't have a record deal and we built that whole, presence. Uh, eventually he got a record deal and, and that was great. And then we built good music that didn't exist. Like I signed John Legend to be our first artist. We built that from nothing. So I built multiple uh, multi-million dollar uh, sort of operations from scratch, but um, that was not, um, yeah, that, that wasn't really appreciated back then. I think now is a little different, but I learned so many things from being a producer selling this music everyone everyone has hot music like producer producer wise but how do you go into a room or to a label or meet with an artist 
and sell them on that vision. And then get them in the room and then actually compel them to produce the right outcome and, and final product. Uh, how do you build teams? Uh, how do you price? You know, when we, we put out, Kanye, if you've ever seen a Kanye West mixtape that came out of my apartment in the East Village, right, of Manhattan, um, how do we price that? We would go to um, wholesalers and from day one, establish a price point that was higher than, than normal. And they'd say, well, why would you, why are you charging us, trying to charge us more for this new artist that no one's ever heard of? We have philosophy around making the best product, including the best music, the best graphics, the best CD cases, it's just better all, all around. And we're gonna charge more for it. And it worked. Um, so remixing, you know, taking things that exist and updating them for the, the current market. That's how we made our music. Um, that's how a lot of companies, including tech companies, make their, their products. Um, whether it's Apple and their designs, if you check out like some of the uh, Braun designs from like the 50s and 60s uh, to Instagram, Instagram stories. Remember how when Snapchat came out with the 24 hour content and then Instagram real quick, start adopting it. Now stories is the predominant 24 hour disappearing content. You know, I think I think uh, the one with the audience, uh, I, I guess almost like, you know, the the second mover, you know, takes the cheese, right? Like that's the thing. But that was a great experience for you, you combining your artistic skills, right? Effectively, you're creating. I tell people all the time, whether you play with music or with art or with technology, you're creating and, and, and a mind of a creator is a mind of a creator. So you that that experience and then you formalized it in tech and turned it into products at Vimeo. So you had this combined experience, but hacking YouTube to sort of pioneer interactive web in 2010 is one thing, right? I mean, like people can view that as one video, but then turning a, Turning into a whole company is a range of problems. It's just not like, hey, building a product, but it's selling the product. It's raising money. How did you evangelize the first set of customers to believe in this vision? Like, how did that come about? Yes. The first customers, well, I certainly leaned on relationships uh, to get my foot in the, the uh, door, but I really... I really just shared this, the same story I shared with, with you. Um, and, and what's interesting thing is that a lot of people have been trying to do this anyways. They're trying to make more fun or dynamic videos, but there's just not an easy way to uh, do it. Hmm. So, um, so yeah, early on, I told people the same story and I, and I said, it's real. I built this thing. It's super easy. We'll make it very easy for you to experiment with, with this. And so first couple of customers, um, I helped them make content in this format using some simple tools that I built and it worked. So these are big companies that are pitting this content out and they could quantifiably measure that it dramatically got more people to go visit their website. It got more people, Sundance Channel is one of our, one of our first customers. Sundance Channel was saying, uh, more people saw this and wanted to tune in, plan to tune in and watch this TV show than people that didn't. Like we did a lot of testing. This worked. It changed their ROI on their media. And so then the people that work with Sundance, they start contacting us saying, how do we work with you? This, this worked. And that's how it, it, it grew. Fantastic. And I mean, like now you have big brands, right? Like the H&Ms, Nespresso's, Paramount. How does the product work? Like, give me an example of a use case. Give our audience an example of a use case, how some of these brands leverage adventure. And I'm assuming they use the contest, con, uh, content that comes out of adventure across multiple platforms. Right. Yeah. So let me, if, this is, um, it's, it's easier to, to, to show folks and, and you can definitely go to adventure.ai 
adventr.ai. You can see stuff there, but I'll, I'll explain in, in, in the meantime, sort of how, how this works. We've matured a lot since that YouTube hacking, obviously. And um, we've, we've evolved from this sort of choose your own adventures or interactive concept to more what I call now uh, video as an application. So now anyone can make videos that are not only interactive and you can choose what happens in them, but you can also talk to them. You can connect the videos to your software, to your CRM, to external data points, so that your videos can take in data, understand data, and then change what each person sees based on data that's relevant for that particular person. So how could that work, for example? Um, 23andMe is one of our customers. So 23andMe has obviously millions of their own customers. Each one of those customers has their own story. They each got an individual um, product from 23andMe. You may have gotten one and it says that you are part Kuwaiti, part English, or wh whatever that might be. Mine would have a different result in it. So using our software, 23andMe can now send a video to millions of customers, including you and me, but your video will have your name in it. It'll have beautiful images of, um, and music from Kuwait and England or wherever. Mine will have music and, and images from uh, Nigeria or, or wherever that may be. So the video, is con it, the, our software is communicating to the CRM and customizing the video for you. And from there, now you have something shareable and we've quantified, you will be a 23andMe, you, you will purchase from 23andMe again sooner with these sorts of more personalized in, engagements. So that's one example of how a big company uses this more intelligent media through our system to improve the, their outcomes. Fantastic. Now, your company is leveraging AI, right? And AI is all the buzzword today. And like, you can't have a conversation with anyone without AI coming into the discussion. And so how are you leveraging AI more specifically, right? Like yeah, you've created gamified and playable media experiences using your technology. And so give us some specific examples of its impact on say commercials and games and movies. I mean, the name of the game is engagement. We're in the age of micro content where I think like even like in on social, it went from like 60 seconds to like 30 seconds. And now there are 10, 15 seconds. Like people, attention spans are going down. You got to get them in the first couple seconds almost for them to stay hooked. Yeah. And that what you're describing now is exactly the problem that we help solve. In a attention-starved economy, uh, when people have content that is personalized or that's actually interactive that they can touch and personalize it themselves, they watch longer. They remember more. They purchase more. They sign up faster. This is just a fact. Similar to when you had a radio, then you added TV. Like adding that another sense, a whole body sense to it, totally changes the relationship to that content. Um, so in terms of AI, um, you know, there, there's a scene in this movie, Minority uh, Report, one of my favorite movies, where Tom Cruise walks into um, the Gap store and the store, they scan his eyes and then a hologram pops up and gives him personalized one-to-one, -one, hey, welcome back. How did those tank tops work, work out for you? They knew who he was and they knew what he purchased, and they're asking him about his experience. He could have touched it or spoken back and said, oh, those tank tops were too small. That is what we're building. That is literally the vision for what adventure is. Media that communicates to the viewer one-to-one, -one, and that viewer can talk to it, can touch it, is media that is truly web-enabled. In order for that to happen, we use AI to turn what you are saying to that media into language that the video and our technology can understand. 
Um, so that's I'm simplifying it, but that's one one layer of how we use AI. Obviously, as generative AI continues to get better in terms of video, the idea is that any video that you're watching will be able to change, respond. You talk to it; they talk back. You talk to people who are deceased. These are these are what we're we're, we're building now to connect video that we all love to software. That's what really what adventure is. And you took a unique approach to marketing, I guess, because all of your creative experience, right? It's all about standing out. You released this short film called Lab Rat earlier this year. Tell us more about this project and how it showcases some of your tech. Yeah, Lab Rat, which people can check out a little bit of it at labratfilm.com. It's, uh, it's a really exciting film. Uh, we, we've made some awesome technology. We have um, patents and like all that fun stuff. And what we realize is that it's not enough just to build these tools and say, hey, we've made some technology where you can talk to videos now. Good luck. That's not gonna cut it. We have to show people uh, best uses and how to do it. Um, you can sign up for webinars on our site and like learn, learn about it. Um, but we need to also inspire people, not just enable them. So LabRat is one of the um, one of the projects that we're putting out to show people what's possible in this new media future. LabRat is a short film, it's like a twenty minute film, and it's the first multiplayer movie. So it's interactive, and everyone watching the film controls the film together. So. If, if you're watching in a theater, I just got back from Portugal. We showed it to over a thousand people in one, in one room, right? Um, or whether you're online or in your living room watching it with your friends, you take your phone, a QR code pops up, you scan the QR code, and then you're in the uh, game. So as the movie plays at different parts, um, choices come up that the audience interacts with. And you can see in the, in the movie what people are voting on when it's re really close. And um, and there's different surprises, there's puzzles, there's codes, and all these things pop up on your phone and you interact and you can see what everyone else is doing too. And um, so the, the, the movie experience to what happens depends totally on who you're watching it with. That is um, crazy, that is crazy. So basically every movie, every social media video, every ad, turns effectively multiplayer mode turns into a game yeah i mean games 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 are the language of the youth um as as you probably know and folks listening to, to this know uh, people expect more agency over their their web experience games are is an exploding category so a game isn't even just a game anymore with mm -hmm. the school a game is like a, a way of life now. 100%, man. It's The name of the game is interaction. I think we interact so much with our phones and with video content already that this is a natural progression if the world, if brands want to continue to engage their audience. It's no more like one to many. It's like people to people. It's interaction is the name of the game. Now, en route to building this company over the last several years, what were some of the biggest challenges you faced and, and what did you do to overcome them? Yeah. Uh, well, I think we, we, we talked about the, 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 the capital challenge. Um, yeah. But then you eventually raised $5 million in seed funding for Adventure, which is you know, pretty good for a New York-based startup. So you know, how did yeah. you overcome that? Uh, I mean that, and, and well, as as I mentioned, I I reset sort of that that narrative to be more of a video person. I went to Vimeo and worked there, and um, but beyond that, I actually came with a product that had customers. I think we already had a patent pending. Uh, we had some really awesome stuff with a proven uh, value proposition that's becoming more and more. Uh, relevant. Video is not going anywhere. Video is 100%. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk called us in, uh, what was it, 2004? He said video. He was like all up on video. He said video is going to explode. If you don't jump on it, you're going to regret it. This was 
2004 when he was, uh, you know, doing the wine library stuff and that trend uh, played on, right? Yeah, yeah. And and I'm telling you, the things I'm we're talking about today, video being just more uh, dynamic and being more connected and intelligent, it seems interesting now, five, 10 years from now, this will be standard. Of course, if you think about making one video and then I'm going to send it to millions of people and hope that they like it, and hope it works for me, that's kind of crazy on the internet. Um, and so that that's a paradigm that someone is going to uh, shift and why not have it be us? Yesterday's innovation always becomes tomorrow's commodity, man. You see, we don't say dot com anymore. We don't say social company anymore. We don't say cloud. We don't say mobile. And the same thing, you won't say AI anymore, right? I think these things will become embedded. And as people try to bake through attention, like with, you know, the similarities with like websites, right? Like people put on multiple versions of websites. So A-B test what's going to work and what's going to not resonate with the audience. With They do the same with ads. And video is just a form of the most engaging content one can interact with because it's become part of our life. If you look at people spend so much time, I think the stat was something like how much video content does one scroll across like an Insta or uh, Snapchat, TikTok, or oh, yeah. Schwartz feed. It's like a skyscraper, right? Per oh, day. The average Man. American watches over five hours of video a day. Like, yeah, so that's insane. Um, the over 80% of web traffic, just the web going around you is video. We're on video right now. Like YouTube, Netflix, that's what the internet is, is video. But we're still using this sort of data. Uh, yeah, we're just going to make one version. Good luck. Everybody dig into it. And so, um, yeah, we, we, we're moving. We're in a video first world. Every social media platform focuses on video. Every brand uses video. Um, we, but how do we make it more efficient? How do we make it capture people's attention more? And how do we make it so that, you know, if I want to um, sell you this phone and selling is one thing, but let's just talk about selling something for now. Typically we'll say, hey, we got these great phones. Next time you're thinking about a phone, remember this phone. On the internet, everything should be actionable. You should be able to say, Hey, we got these phones. You like it? What color do you like? Oh, red? Yo, you want the red one? Okay, just say I want it and we're going to send it to you right now. That's where we're going to get to. And that requires connectivity and communication. And that's all adventure is, is building that pipeline for, for that automation. Fantastic. So, you know, you had a hard time raising. You went out there and got some customers on the vision. Um, and when you went back out to raise... You know, you already had the traction, but how did you fund that first product and, you know, getting customers, et cetera, what came first, the customers or the product? And how did you manage to fund that? And then walk us a little bit through your fundraising process once you had traction. So, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs uh, can take some advice from it as they're looking. Uh, well, I, I self-funded for quite a while. And, and then I raised, I raised a bit of money from family and friends, um, a few hundred thousand there. And, th and these are my friends largely from, uh, from Wharton, um, who have seen, they, they've seen me before do things that, that, you know, they said, that's kind of, that's crazy. Why would you get into the rap business? And it worked out. And so I think people have some confidence from, from there, but they naysayed you and then you prove them wrong. And they're like, Hey, listen, we don't want to miss the next thing he does. Yes. <laughs> um, so, so, and, and that's really, you know, I tell people all the time, that's really one of the, the real benefits of going to these sorts of colleges. I don't remember much of what I learned at Wharton, but those are some of my best friends and supporters um, that I did get from, from there, even to, to today. We're texting earlier today. Um, so some of them work, work in, in, in my company. Um, so, uh, so that's the, the benefit there. But yeah, self-funding, friends and family, uh, until I got enough momentum to where it could be, um, to where it could be an interesting story for uh, uh, institutions. And then for institutional, your interest, institutional raise, 
that would have been much easier. Like, how did that come about? Was it the network? I, I firmly believe, right? Your community is your currency. I have not much of a schooler. My wife's a Stanford grad. Um, Stanford, uh, now she teaches medicine at Stanford. And she's the opposite of me. Like, ah, oh, you got to go to school. You got to go to school. And then I finally realized, actually, what school gives you is a network, right? It gives you a community. And I'm everything I am because of that community. My my co-founder and I were best friends in college, and we built a number of companies together, uh, failed together, and then the last one hit it well. And so I, then I, I came to terms with it, that it's not what you study there, it's who you meet that comes through later on in life. But nonetheless, um, how did those doors open for you? Like, was it the same group of people, and was it easier? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the, well, even, you know, going back to w when we started the music stuff, you know, Kanye, I, I happened to have met one time. Um, and then I brought my college roommate into that mix and he became John Legend. A lot of our, our early customers, my investors, they're all relationship driven. Um, but then as we got to the institutional conversations, I literally... I was just like, I'm going to be open-minded and and talk with with anyone credible who wants to talk to me. So I was actually, I have a sales call with a gardener. A gardener had called me, like they call every business owner, and we're like, hey, we can help you do X, X, Y, Z. And um, and I'm like, I'm not, I, we don't have any money to do any gardener stuff. Uh, but they're like, well, I think what you're doing, um, you know, this guy over here would really like it. And maybe he can help fund it. And I, I said, all right, well, I'll meet with this guy because we definitely need some funding. And that guy said, hey, you should talk to my buddy over here. He he finances stuff and he I think he'll like this. I'm like, all right, this you know how many times people say, Oh, my my buddy might might like this. So then I talked to his friend, and then his friend's like, Oh, you should talk to this VC fund. Uh, I think they'll be into this. I'm like, all right. Now they're about to get into the fourth layer of this conversation talk to the VC fund and they're, you know, after a couple of meetings, they're like, yeah, we like it and we'll get into business with you. I was, I was so jaded by this time with years of rejection that I was just like, yeah, okay, whatever. And I just didn't even like pay attention to it. And then the fund contacts me again. They're like, no, serious. Uh, we, we want to like fund, fund this. And, um, and so that, that's how it started from being open to, um, conversations with, with with credible folks and, and then at that time i ended up getting two term sheets within like a week um after i built up enough uh, credibility and uh, and traction you took money from both the term sheets or how do you pick any advice there on on picking the right investment partner yeah i mean yes at that particular time um they were very different valuations so they were they were different amounts of money for the same percentage of the the, the company. What I was able to do is to get um, the smaller firm to basically to co invest with the larger firm at the larger firm's larger valuation, and of course you know with the thinking that this larger firm will ideally be able to help propel us, um, and 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 that should give some confidence to the the smaller firm uh, as as well. Uh, but yeah, we ended up getting both both firms on on, on our, our 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 cap table. Fantastic. As we close out here for the day, um, could you share some insights on the future of connected media and how you see sort of the convergence of music, AI, and technology shaping this landscape? I mean, we talked about a lot of this through our conversation, but how is adventure adapting? and viewing the future and what do you have that's exciting that's coming out on the horizon? Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned websites earlier and websites being uh, dynamic and sort of flexible and hundred percent. That's sort of what people expect from expect from their, their web experience. Whenever websites started, websites were only the uh, domain of like big corporations. And you had to hire a, a developer to make it. And it might cost you $100,000 to make a website. And, and people would be like, a person would never need a website. Or a small business, you, you, you would never need that. Pretty quickly, we get to where now all of us have websites. Like, 
even if it's a LinkedIn website, we have a dedicated web presence, if not many. Um, and you can make one for free in minutes. And so, like, like you were saying, that in, the, in, the innovation becomes a, a commodity. I would suggest that folks out there learn about um, these interactive media. I, I happen to think we have the best sort of body of work and best practices around it. Check out adventure.ai. But I will tell you for a fact that the, the uh, retail places, the media companies, um, stores that you sh shop at, they are investing in and learning about these interactive formats because they deliver more from an ROI perspective. So I, I highly suggest that people familiarize themselves with what is going to become normal over the next few years. Um, for adventure, where we sit in, in that is, it's been really exciting to work with, um, you know, these, a lot of the brands that you, you, you mentioned, which have been on a sort of transactional basis of like, Lexus is going to make this really cool interactive sort of game for the summertime to get people to sign up for this test drive. That is awesome. And they'll get more people to sign up by using our, our tool. Um, the exciting thing that, that we're working on now is more, um, so, so let's say that's a marketing relationship. We're excited to start driving product relationships. And so that means where this technology, where there's video you can interact with, video you can talk to, um, video that knows who you are and is customized for you because of the data that the, the creator already has. Um, that being, that's going to be showing up more into your products. So maybe if you're playing a game on a gaming console, you're going to see something that has your name in it and says, hey, Jack, thanks for coming back or whatever that is, or maybe exercise equipment. Um, there's lots of partnerships sort of in development now that these sort of experiences are going to be built into your the fabric of your everyday sort of web uh, ex experience. And so... That's what I'm super excited about is this being more normalized. Fantastic, man. I truly, truly enjoyed our conversation. Dating back to, you know, in the early 2000s, I'm an engineer, but I my first job was cold calling for a startup. And I worked my journey like from cold calling to running product and sales and marketing and so on. And I, I still remember everything I learned about marketing was from watching videos on YouTube. Right, I, I wasn't formally educated, and one of them was Gary Vaynerchuk, was a hugely bullish on the future of video, and that's only played out right from interact from one to many, then to many to many, and now multiplayer, fully interactive, which you guys are pioneering. Pioneering, so super, super excited to see what's coming out of Adventure. Where can we find you? Where are you most active on socials? Uh, LinkedIn. I think at Devo.Harris, we, we, we're we putting a lot of content there and, and sort of some of the same sort of conversations around lessons I've, I've learned uh, from music and culture that we that we put into um, adventure. But um, but yeah, I'm a Devo Harris on LinkedIn. Um, you can also adventure on LinkedIn, A-D-V-E-N-T-R. Check out our website, A-D-V-E-N-T-R. Uh, we, we couldn't afford the last U and the E as we got started. Um, so, but adventure.ai, you can see lots of stuff there. You can talk to videos and, and learn more about the uh, technology there. So that's what I've been uh, playing with your website. It's pretty cool, yeah. actually. Yes, yes. We're we're yeah. revamping it now to be a lot more sort of ROI focused, but it's, it's a lot easier for people to see and play with stuff uh, there. So... Uh, you can always reach out on, on LinkedIn or on Instagram, Spring Steezy, my uh, rapper name. Um, on Instagram, your your handle is Spring Steezy. Yes. Devo Springsteen was my producer name. I won all my Grammys and you know music stuff was there. So um, we still have fun with that uh, name. Awesome. I will follow you there. I think I follow Devo Harris, but uh, I'll follow Spring Steezy on Instagram. 
Okay, awesome. This was a great conversation, man. Wishing you huge success in changing the way brands and humans interact with one another. We have video content. Thank you so much. Thank you. I need some traction.